City. November 1966, including the entire Twin City area. We sometimes think that we are immune to the shock of rapid change. And yet we are continually confronted by unbelievable contrasts that appear before us. A large percentage of our population is fighting for its civil rights and take to the streets and jails to move the nation to consider its second-class citizenship. Poverty and crime are all around us. But at the same time, we have produced a standard of living for many Americans far beyond the dreams of kings in the immediate past. Automation and its allies have created vast new blocks of time for all of us. We are in the midst of a revolution in lifestyle, characterized by frantic entertainment on one hand and a feeling of emptiness on the other. The problem that we will be looking at on this program is this leisure time that's available to all of us. The enemy within. Some people have voiced the opinion that the greatest threat to American society is the increase in our leisure time. Students of history have voiced the vague but ominous notice that there is more than a tenuous connection between how a people use or abuse their leisure and the decline or survival of their civilization. How our nation uses its free time tells us much about the texture of the society and provides indications for the future. The real threat in a civilization's decline is the enemy within. Its name is not subversion or revolution, but misspent time. How all of us collectively use our leisure time could make or break our culture, reveal its moral worth, and have an impact on our nation's destiny in terms of cultural degeneration or cultural flowering in years to come. Next to the abundance of things, the most significant characteristic of the American scene is the abundance of free time, and too often this free time means boredom. The distraughtness that disturbs contemporary man is expressed in the revealing phrase, killing time. It implies that we find leisure difficult to face. Killing time is an expression of modern man's self-alienation, which he refuses to acknowledge. Instead, he either escapes into a world of feverish activities or indulges in idleness in order to fill the void. The delinquency of youth and the despair of the aged reveal something of the albatross about the neck of those for whom leisure means little but idleness. What do we as individuals do about this potential problem of leisure? Larry Harris of the Hennepin County Community Health and Welfare Council raises these questions. One of the areas in, in the whole situation of leisure time that, that many families face is the tremendous need to, to be a success in their leisure. In their leisure. Uh, we found a situation where many families are concerned that uh, their cottage is fixed up just right, and the question is whether or not families and individuals are using leisure time for themselves or for a way to impress other persons. Uh, leisure time has certainly been commercialized. Uh, we read magazines that, that tell us to purchase this kind of fly rod uh, to make sure that we drive that kind of camper uh, to attend this resort to, to fly north or to fly south, and that we've become so concerned that we impress others in use of our leisure time, we sometimes fail to know when to relax. The whole area of use of leisure time by the American family is one where we have, at many instances, failed to set priorities. When do we work together as a family in a leisure time situation? When do we allow individuals their own freedom to set priorities? Uh, we can look back at the old army rest break uh, when everything was stopped and there was complete relaxation, you know, almost falling apart. I think that those of us who are looking for the best use of leisure time 
have to look when do we use leisure as a way in which we can grow and improve ourselves and when can we use it as a situation for a total relaxation. When can a family allow itself to work as a unit in their leisure time and when can a family allow the individual persons to do just as they please. The problem of leisure is of course no less the problem of life. Modern man's persistent myth is that leisure is a frivolity that is apart from the concerns of life that really matter. But it's a crucial part of the very search for meaning in life, inasmuch as the social malaise of our time has been diagnosed as anxiety and boredom, alienation and meaninglessness. Increasingly, it is our leisure time that reveals either the meaningfulness or the pointlessness of our lives. And leisure is indeed increasing. Let me cite a few statistics on the shortened work week. The long-term trend indicates that since 1900, there has been an average reduction of four hours in the work week for each decade. It's a striking fact to realize that the working man of a century ago spent some 70 hours at work and lived about 40 years. Today, he spends some 40 hours per week at work and can be expected to live about 70 years. This adds something like 22 more years of leisure to his life. How are we spending this time? What clues about the quality of American life can be detected through the leisure choice activities of its citizens? In answering these questions, we are immediately confronted with a tremendous variety of leisure choices, literally hundreds, all the way from going to the opera to playing slot machines. As you may have guessed, the most time-consuming and highly visible of these leisure time activities is spent with one or another of the mass media, television, radio, popular books and magazines, movies and newspapers. Professor of Speech and Communications, Eugene J. Berg comments. Behind me are some modern buildings in which men are preparing for ministry. In tomorrow's world, these men are going to have to help share the job of preparing people for the time when all of us are going to have much more free time. And some people are simply going to have no jobs at all. In other words, free time all the time. Studies show that in our use of free time, most of us spend most of our time with the mass media of communication, that is with radio and newspapers and the movies and especially with television. And surely in the future we're going to spend even more time with television than we do now. I'm in the mood to say good. I think it's a cause for celebration that we're going to be relieved of some of the busy work of life and able to use the time more creatively and better. And I think, too, there are some tremendous possibilities in the medium that you're watching right now. All of us surely have seen this with our children, who've been given a real window on the world. And as adults, surely we have grown by the public debate and by the information and the good entertainment that the tube offers us when it's operating at its best. But there are some lurking demons here, too. I think we are all kind of suspicious when we watch the kids glued to the television set on a Saturday morning. Suspicious of the fact that television may be trying to enslave us. Real leisure means, of course, something more than simply free time. It means the opportunity to choose how we're going to use the time we're given. And studies show right now that most of us would really rather do something else than watch television all the time. Well, then why do you suppose we do it? Why do we give so much time to television, more time to it than to anything else in life except for working and for sleeping. Is it, as somebody has suggested, that television has a kind of narcotic effect? Perhaps television and the other mass media of information tend to make us something less than men and women, make us perhaps uh, more like piano keys or puppets dancing on strings. Maybe the question is just this plain. In the future, when we're going to have much more time in our hands, how are we going to use it? Will we be liberated for new forms of life? Or will we find some new kind of slavery? Well, because they're so important in answering this question, I think the mass media deserve our real attention and our best energies. And I'm talking about ours, yours and mine, those of us who watch and who read and who listen. Because in, Americans, in the American system, the communications consumer still plays a very important part in determining what the media are and what the message is. And so I suggest that we take hold and begin to be selective in our use of the mass media right within our homes. But we're going to need help. We're in desperately, uh, desperately in need of the help of the communication specialist and the leaders in the communications industry. 
who must be urged to act responsibly first and commercially second. If not, if they will not, then I think we're going to have to think about reshaping the ways in which the government authorizes these functions. I suggest, too, we need the help of and we need to be helpful to those who operate educational channels through our support financially, through our encouragement and good counsel. I think we need the help of the church, the school, and other agencies in the community. We need education and understanding of how to use our free time. And right now, I would suggest in the use of the mass media, we are not prepared to make free time into satisfying and creative leisure. What about the arts? What is their role? Beth Linerson, director of the Moppet Players, offers these observations. The structure and tempo of the American life has changed most dramatically within the past 20 years. Millions of Americans are suddenly finding a great deal of time on their hands, time that they can use as they desire. And many millions of Americans are spending this time in museums, art galleries, theaters, and music halls. It would seem as though we're headed toward a, a virtual cultural renaissance, a cultural boom, so to speak. In the mid-40s, most of the cultural activity was centered and concentrated in just a few cities. These were primarily located on the East Coast. This is no longer true. A tremendous amount of enthusiasm and vigor has developed throughout the country, and cultural centers such as the St. Paul Arts and Science Center have developed throughout the country. We're no longer as a country concerned with the drudgery of self-preservation, but have gone on to be concerned with a much more important problem, that of the very quality of our existence. It remains to be seen what the American people will do with culture and the arts. The arts are waiting. Arts, the arts have been made accessible. And it remains to be seen if they do go forward to change the very essence of our being or whether it just become a complex of beautiful buildings and musty long-winded committees. This building houses many people who must be concerned with our increase in leisure time. Judge Archie Gingold comments. Quite a number of the tragic problems that our courts deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are symptomatic of the failure of people to properly utilize their leisure time. In the misdemeanor court, the judge sees it in intoxication, disorderly conduct, assault and battery, and in certain traffic cases. In the district court, the judge sees it in the gross misdemeanors, in the felonies, and in divorce and separation cases. In the juvenile court, the judge sees the children that have been neglected through their parents' abuse of leisure time. We likewise see delinquent children who have been emotionally damaged because their parents are using leisure time in a detrimental fashion. Some of these children are already using leisure time in a self-destructive manner because they have identified with the poor examples of their own parents. This waste or abuse of leisure time will increase as the 40-hour work week is further reduced unless our communities immediately go to work with saturation programs of an educational character, programs which will include the vocational people, those who can teach hobbies and skills, the psychologists, the anthropologists, the social workers, both casework and group work, the religious groups, because they represent a great potential for good in the field of leisure time. And all the other helping professions should also be marshaled to the end that leisure time can, be, can become a part of a constructive way of life, an instrument of human happiness. 
Thus far, we've seen what people in many fields think about leisure. Let's hear now from two eminent religious leaders in the Twin Cities for their insights. On the problem of leisure, the Second Vatican Council has commented, the widespread reduction in working hours brings increasing advantages to numerous people. May these leisure hours be properly used for relaxation of spirit and the strengthening of mental and bodily health. I think that abundant leisure will require some new thinking. We identify one another by what we do, by our job, by the way we earn a living. Every person almost has understood that work was expected of him. America has never tolerated the idle rich. We have indeed known what free time is. We fill it with pastimes till we can return to our toil. Hours off duty we enjoy, a weekend, a restful vacation. These refresh us physically and mentally, but we are thinking in terms of getting back to our work. Leisure time has been a bit suspect. We're uneasy when we must think not of play but of leisure. Most persons, I think, become upset about retirement. Work seems to be essential for their contentment, even for their identity. They cannot face up to leisure with equanimity. It is not that we have all of us found meaning in our work. We hear people complain about the emptiness of life. Often, these people have crowded schedules. Many demands are made on them. A great psychiatrist has said that the meaninglessness of life is the great neurosis of this generation. Here in this metropolitan area, we are asking questions about leisure, many more than I have raised. We're thinking less about recreation and more about recreating our citizens. Society needs to become conscious of the problems involved, and society needs to adapt itself to meet them. The Second Vatican Council points out that men find readier opportunities for attaining their inheritance uh, of intellectual and spiritual culture as they enjoy more leisure. Philosophers, scientists, artists, teachers, physicians, Lawyers, clergymen, learned men must increase, and they must be accorded merited esteem. The Council says further, the opportunity should be afforded to workers to develop their own abilities and personalities through the work they perform. All workers should also enjoy sufficient rest and leisure to cultivate their family, cultural, social, and religious life. They should also have the opportunity to develop on their own the resources and potentialities to which perhaps their professional work gives but little scope. Here, too, I mention, with the Council, lesser things, perhaps, but important. Physical exercise and sports events, which can help to preserve emotional balance even at the community level, and to establish fraternal relations among men of all conditions, nations, and races. If community facilities for leisure are to be organized, there is no other organizer than the City of Man whatever be its system of operation. But what is the role of the church in meeting these problems? The synagogue has shown the way, or should I say, God himself. Remember, thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Something good happens to a person who worships in spirit and in truth. The Jewish observance of the Sabbath is an instance of the use of leisure at its best. For the Christian, I know it firsthand. The celebration of divine worship is the deepest of the springs by which leisure is fed. Leisure, as I would use the word, embraces everything which is integral in the full human existence. It is indeed the proper scope of religion to lead men to their last end, the supreme good, but also it embraces in its vision intermediate ends, the true, the beautiful, the good. Love of God has its natural outworking in love for neighbor. Religion fosters justice and charity. The leisure I envision must not be for the few, but the many, for all. It will exclude no creed, no race, no color. It will be the instrument of God's presence, reaching from end to end mightily and ordering all things sweetly. Already the religious bodies have done a noble work providing in our cities church-sponsored liberal arts colleges. These are, and must continue, a primary source for the form and spirit of leisure. The vision which made them possible will find new and beneficent ways in which the good God will make them his instruments, providing the leadership and learning our society needs. Do you feel guilty about having leisure time? Many people do. 
The doctrine of vocation in the Christian church may have contributed to this. Have we not tended to glorify work? We have often emphasized its therapeutic value for the inner growth of the individual. And did not our Lord say, My Father worketh hitherto, and I must work? And again on another occasion, I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. But science has catapulted us into an industrial technological age. Machines have become our slaves, and increasingly leisure will be plentifully available for very, very large segments of the population. This compels us to accept the likelihood of much leisure. It compels us to recognize that when Jesus spoke about the necessity of work, it was less a matter of toil and more an emphasis on the investment of time in those things which make for meaningful living. In addressing itself to the question of leisure time, the Church must first of all enlist the laity in the transmission of the gospel through teaching and evangelistic concern. There must be encouragement of all that makes for well-ordered community living. This will certainly involve participation of Christians in every level of political life. Participation in the arts, music, drama, painting, sculpture, poetry, all of this becomes a means of expression, fulfillment, and communication. Guidance in reading, reflection, conversation, recreation, and play will assist many to invest leisure time with meaning. And always the Church must encourage its people to allow time to be invested in moving through life with compassion, ready to listen to the outpourings of the lonely and the frustrated to weep with those who weep, and to rejoice with those who rejoice. Joseph Pieper, a German Roman Catholic layman, has placed the emphasis where it belongs in offering a slightly revised translation of the 10th verse of the 46th Psalm. Have leisure and know that I am God. Our last guest on this program is looked upon as perhaps the expert on the subject of leisure. He is Robert Lee, Professor of Christian Social Ethics and Society at San Francisco Theological Seminary and author of Religion and Leisure in America. Professor Lee, in your book you indicate that the collective use of our leisure time could make or break our culture. In which direction are we headed and why? That's a very interesting question, but I think that if we are to learn our lesson from history, we would see that in the past some cultures have vanished or declined or disappeared because of the abuse and the misuse of their leisure time, which has meant the quality of their very life suffered drastically. Now I would say that in our society we now have the possibilities, we are standing at the threshold of a new leisure revolution that is about to break in upon us with even much greater scope than we've ever known before. So we now have the possibility to work out this aspect of improving the quality of life of our very existence. Now I think that we will be unable to do this unless we see what has been, as it were, an obstructing factor in all this. And I would suggest that from the, the religious standpoint, the, the factor that has hindered, that has kept us behind, is that we are so oriented toward what might be called a work ethic. This is the legacy, the heritage of the Protestant Reformation. It had its very good role to play in our life when we are an agricultural and agrarian economy. But now that we are a technological and urban economy with greater automation and technology, now we need to develop a new leisure ethic. And I would suggest that we cannot do this unless we supplement the old work ethic. You know how so many of us are so wedded 
to work. We have a work, work, work mentality. And we feel very uncomfortable when we're not working. Many of us feel guilty when we're not working. Uh, someone has su suggested there's such a thing as, as weekend neuroses or acute leisureitis. We don't know what to do with ourselves at leisure as we do at work. So if we are going to improve the quality of our existence, which will have something to do with the very texture, with the very quality of our culture, then we need to radically supplement this old work ethic, the work mentality, the so-called doctrine of vocation, and add to it a leisure ethic or a doctrine of avocation. And I would suggest that some of the ingredients of this new ethic for a new leisure society, which are spelled out in my book, Religion and Leisure in America, have to do with uh, recognizing that all of time is a gift. It comes to us as a gift, and yet we, don't, we, we always say we don't have the time, we don't have the time, when as a matter of fact, the whole of time is a gift. And a new leisure ethic must recognize the eventfulness or the quality, the qualitative dimension in life, that much of our time uh, is a flat, dull plane of existence. But we need to look at the quality of existence, which can only come through the memorable events. And then finally, the sense of, of joy that must be radiated through all our life, the, the kind of enjoyment. You know, when John Calvin said that uh, man's highest goal is not to work, is but to worship God and to enjoy Him forever. It's this capacity of joy which will give us uh, much more enrichment of the new leisure ethic. So I would suggest that if we are to increase the quality of our existence against the threat of a decline in our culture, we must learn to affirm a new leisure ethic which is based on some theological resources which will help to change our outlook and therefore our behavior patterns and the way we approach the, way we approach the new leisure society uh, as such. And in this, we will prove to uh, improve the quality of our existence rather than uh, have it decline in its cultural sense. Ultimately, conquering the enemy within can be done by no one but me and you. Thank <laughs> you.